Good afternoon. Let's get started. I'm really ecstatic today for no wide number of reasons. Uh, I think it's all due to the power of John. So many different people from different departments and different modes of life on campus. I've never seen an epic seminar where we didn't force attendance on graduate students and have such a large attendance. So that's what makes me feel very excited. So this experiment in interdisciplinary collaborative uh, research, maybe uh, that I think is beginning to grow. I'm very happy. And I'm very happy today uh, to present to you uh, uh, Professor John Preston, who is the Vice Chancellor for LSU Ag Center. And uh, his association with LSU goes long back. Uh, he was telling me over the lunch that uh, he was here from 1984 to 1984 and then went to Illinois for some years and then came back in 2007 and I joined here in 2009 and uh, I had the good fortune of working uh, in his group. He has a, is the director of a very large grant from UOTK and the goal of the grant was actually to promote this kind of interdisciplinary research by bringing people from different walks in agriculture, within agriculture, from production, from logistics, from uh, harvesting, all the way to conversion, chemical conversion. So there is a beautiful pilot plant in the Oregon Sugar Institute, if you haven't seen, there are a lot of other engineering students here. It is an opportunity to go and visit there and see what they do. So you will see a lot of unit operations that chemical engineers are from there, so you recognize them. And uh, we were just telling you about lunch that they were able to produce actually a large amount of syrup and send it to a biochemical company for conversion. And he will tell you the whole story because I listened to him. The project is coming to an end for five years now. And uh, he has been able to put together the various groups that were working on this to present a coherent picture. And that picture is the future. And that is, how do we achieve sustainable manufacturing? in the chemical space. How do you derive chemicals? Right now, most of the plastics that you see are all derived from fossil-based uh, fuels, uh, from natural gas, from crude oil, etc. And most of the transportation fuel is coming from that. So there is one revolution, of course, that is taking place in terms of batteries, etc. But there is another one. We will need fuels, we will need chemicals, we will need pharmaceuticals, etc. derived from chemicals. And the alternate pathway is bio-based. Uh, agricultural feedstock base. And Louisiana is ideally situated for that because it is strong in agriculture, it has plenty of water, it's strong in chemicals. So how do we shape the future in terms of blending hybrid feedstocks to keep our chemical plants running and how do we gradually evolve towards a sustainable manufacturing in chemical industry is a challenge and I think it's being addressed nationally at several levels. And EPIC is contributing in that discussion in some small way by bringing different people from different departments on process intensification, process innovation, etc. Today, it is really my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor John Russell and uh, I look forward to listening to the lecture again. Again? It's well, it's awesome. changed somewhat since the first time you've heard it. I'm sure you have a lot of new stories to tell as well. So good afternoon. Stories. Good to see you all. I'm going to begin today by breaking a rule. Anybody else in here a rule breaker besides me? <laughs> I, will break, I will break a rule, the very first rule you learned in professor school. That is, never begin a lecture with an apology. But I will begin this with an apology. And that is that I'm going to present this talk. I didn't do any of the work. So you may have seen like I've, I've done it all, I'm very brilliant, basically it's all been done by other scientists. I will acknowledge them as, as we go through the talk. But I'm here basically to summarize all that we've done over the past four and one half years. This project is one of seven funded in 2010 by the United States Department of Agriculture. And they are grouped in different areas of the United States and basically, they are focused on developing logistics for feedstock production 
transportation and processing. In the northwest, you have trees. I think my battery just hit me. No, I think my battery just died. Yes, it's the weather. Yeah. All right, now I have to go back behind here. In the, this part of the country, you have trees. Up here, you have trees and grass. Here, you have trees and grass. Here, you have grass. Our project, the SUBI project, is the only one that focuses on two different feedstocks. Dry cellulosic biomass and sugar syrups. All the others are simply feedstock projects. And we've learned the hard way that, remember the Kevin Costner movie, If You Build It, They Will Come? Well, we've learned that if you grow it, they don't always come. And so we've got to find something else besides feedstock production in order to make this process successful. So we are fortunate to have two different streams. Now, our project is based on sugarcane production. And because all of you live in Louisiana, I'm going to spend just a few minutes going through some different aspects. One is a little bit of agriculture, a little bit of history, and a little bit of chemical and mechanical engineering. I'm not an expert on any of those, but I'll do my best to spin a very good story. Sugarcane, produced in our state. We are the largest producer of sugarcane in the U.S. <coughs> How many of you have ever walked through a sugarcane field? Oh, good. Very good. Feels nice on your arms, doesn't it? <laughs> Only if you have long sleeves. This is the area of the state in which sugarcane is produced. And I'm going to spin this story for a couple of reasons. Largely in the south central part of the state of Louisiana. And it is a very unique crop in that we don't plant a seed. You can't go to Lowe's and buy a bag of sugarcane seed. It's planted as a vegetative crop. So each year, stalks of mature cane are cut. And they are planted often by hand, so it's a very expensive, labor-intensive process. They open a furrow, they lay stalks in by hand, and they'll come in and cover with soil. So it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, and a lot of money. Dr. Ben, how much per acre to plant sugar cane? If you're looking at just steel run cane, about $650 an acre. $650 an acre just to plant it. That's a lot of money. After a while, you can see these little tiny green sprouts here. They will sprout because it's vegetative. Every node on the stalk produces an eye that produces a little shoot. So after a few weeks, you'll see that. And then in turn, it will grow. And when you plant your cane in August or September, it grows through the winter. If it gets too cold, it freezes and grows back in the spring. And it reaches harvest maturity in the fall. So beginning in October in Louisiana, we will harvest our shrimp. <coughs> we are done now. But for the past three months, we've been very busy. And you can see this stalk harvester cutting stalks, chopping them into small lengths, removing the leaves, and putting those small lengths of stalk in that basket right there. Those are then hauled to one of 11 sugarcane mills where the green product is processed, as you see here. And then you wind up with sugar. Now I'm noticing the soft drinks over here. None of them contain sugar. Um, okay, this is Cafe Delight, this is sugar, Diamond Crystal. Dr. Ben, what kind of sugar is this? If it says, if it doesn't say pure cane sugar, it's actually beet sugar. That's right. So this engineer, the doctor engineering professor, this is not even sugar cane sugar. This is beet sugar. So I'll give you a little hint. Any place in Louisiana, if you go someplace and get a cup of coffee, and you put an artificial sweetener in your coffee, by law, you must take a packet of sugar, rip it, and throw it away. That way we ensure proper amount of sugar consumption in the state of Louisiana. And you're laughing. That is indeed true. Go to a sugar cane league meeting, you're reading your note. 
go to a meeting of the Sugarcane League and uh, try to do that. Now, this is the connection with chemical engineering. We've been growing sugarcane in Louisiana since 1795, over 200 years. In 1885, a guy named William Stubbs was hired from Auburn, Alabama to come over and to teach the sons of the Louisiana sugar planters how to grow and process sugar better. So he was hired in 1885, and in 1886, right in the middle of what we now know as Audubon Park in New Orleans, there was a sugar plantation that was adapted to a, an experiment station. Now, I don't really know how they got this aerial shot. I know they didn't have drones in 1886, but they got an aerial shot, and you can see the very first beginnings of agricultural research, sugarcane evaluation in downtown New Orleans. The next year, 1887, the Louisiana Agricultural Experiment Station was formed, and Mr. Stubbs became the director. So, agriculture in Louisiana has its roots in sugarcane. But that's not all. He also formed something called the Audubon Sugar School in Audubon Park. And this is an actual picture from, uh, from that time. This is uh, Mr. Stubbs with the students. And they were learning the fine art of what we now know as chemical engineering to refine sugar from sugarcane. So the reason you have a kettle in front of your building is because of the Audubon Sugar School. It moved to Baton Rouge campus in 1897, and it became the foundation for both the College of Engineering and the Department of Chemical Engineering. So this now proves that you are the oldest chemical engineering department in the United States. Congratulations. Okay, that's it with the history. Now let's move on to the agriculture. Our sugarcane mills, they number 11, they off operate on average three to four months of the year. They start harvesting late September, October. They'll harvest through the end of December, sometimes into January, if they need to delay harvest for some reason. And as we've mentioned several times today, as a byproduct of sugar processing, they produce baguettes. Uh, on average, we produce more than 650,000 tons waste baguettes per year. Uh, this is disposed of at the end of the grinding season, usually by a very efficient process known as burning. So we have basically almost a million tons of baguettes each year, biomass, with which we do very little. So within this existing industry, we were awarded this five-year soon to be six years, $17 million project. And we were targeted to develop two new feedstocks. One is energy cane, the other is sweet sorghum. Energy cane is harvested from September to March. Uh, by the time January gets here and it freezes, it turns from green to brown, so you're harvesting green biomass and syrups up until the first frost, and then dried biomass after that. Sweet sorghum is an annual crop, and you can harvest that any time from July through October. And so you add these existing these feedstocks to the existing ones we have, a bagasse, syrups, and molasses. So you put them all together, you have a very nice collection of feedstocks that can form the foundation for any number of uh, chemical intermediaries. And the goal of our project was to develop a diversified stream of feedstocks. If you recall the first slide I showed you, trees, 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 beetle killed dead trees, and some dried grass and bundles. Okay, those are harvested once a year, they sit in piles, and unless you can do something with dried wood or dried straw, you can't do anything with those feedstocks. Our task is to devise strategies for year-round feedstock production for both syrups and biomass. We've had many partners. Their logos are shown, shown here. You'll see more of these as we move through the talk. And of course, many university partners as well. More than 60 different scientists and support staff. Many of those are here in this audience today from Audubon Sugar Institute. 
as is the head of the department, Dr. Ben Lejean, my friend over here, who knows more about sugar in his little finger than I know in my entire body. So if you have any questions about sugar, he's the man to go to. First, I'm going to talk about energy gain. And I'm going to summarize five years of research in two slides. So if you're an agronomist, please pardon me. Energy cane is basically junk sugar cane. We've been doing sugar cane breeding for over a hundred years. And when we get a high fiber, low sugar cane selection, we throw it out. It's not good for the industry. We want low fiber, high sugar. All of a sudden now, we want high fiber canes because of the biomass potential. So we've given them a sexy name, we call it uh, energy cane. It's a hybrid, it's perennial, just like sugar cane is, at least in the tropics. Our partner here has been the USDA Sugar Laboratory in Homa. We work very closely with them. Our progress would not have been possible without them. We've been focusing on a couple of things. We know it's longevity. Dr. Ben, what's the longest you've seen energy cane live? 30 years. 30 years and counting. So it can survive a long time. It doesn't need any inputs. Dr. Ben, in 30 years, how many inputs have been put on there? Well, we did fertilize. You know, we probably put about 80 units of nitrogen, and that's about it. Yeah, so very little in the way of input. And that's little for agriculture. Our task has been to develop new varieties that have cold tolerance. Remember, this is a tropical grass. So once it gets much further north than Baton Rouge, you're going to suffer from winter kill. So our question was, how far north can we push this? By genetic selection and breeding to make this a further cold adapted crop. And this is how far we got. This dot is 32 degrees north latitude. Doesn't seem like much. But at the end of our, our efforts, we can get a crop, let me go up right here for a minute, that looks like this with no inputs for five years, eight to ten dry tons per year. This is pretty amazing, that far north. Uh, used to be the plant should be dead by now. Let me go back one slide. Let's go back, there we go. This shows the projected growth area for this particular biomass crop. You can see, once you get away from the Gulf, there's not much potential for this to survive the winter. So the push has been, and will continue to be, to find genes for cold tolerance. So we can push this production further. The other crop, sweet sorghum. This has been grown throughout the United States for years. If you have a southern heritage, your grandmother and grandfather grew sweet sorghum in your backyard and crushed it to make syrup or rum or whatever they happen to do with their uh, sorghum syrup. So it's a common southern crop, it's just not grown commercially. So our task was to investigate sweet sorghum <coughs> as a feedstock crop for both syrups and biomass. It's an annual, it, it uh, goes to maturity in 90 to 150 days. Already we know it can grow throughout much of the U.S. Our business partner here has been Sears out of California. They provided some of the best adapted hybrids. Because it's an annual crop, and this is where the ag comes in, it takes a little bit of input each year. One of the things it needs is a fair amount of nitrogen. You can put that nitrogen on two ways. You can buy it in a bag made from a chemical off of natural gas or you can grow a, net, a nitrogen fixing cover crop. So you can see some of these right here, clover and uh, hairy vetch, those are both good cover crops for the winter. Those cover crops provide nitrogen at about $20 to $30 an acre. Putting the chemical fertilizer on is $40 to $60 an acre. So not only is this better for the environment, it actually has lower production costs to go a more natural route. Of course, it requires both insecticides and herbicides, so this crop requires more inputs compared to energy gain. The upside is that you can grow it almost anywhere. So it's a trade-off. Do you want higher tonnage? If that's the case, you're restricted to closer to the Gulf where the water, the temperature is warmer. Or if you want a little lower tonnage, but a lot of sugar, 
you can grow this stuff throughout much of the eastern United States. And a comparison is shown here of harvest durations, inputs, planting, annual versus perennial, dry tons per acre, energy gain a little more in the way of dry tonnage than sweet sorghum. This one tends to be pretty sweet, so you get a lot of syrups from it. So both will work. But in order for someone to grow it, they have to be able to sell it. That's the challenge. Right now, there is no market for this. So how do we develop a market for these feedstocks? First, you've got to enter a conversation that no one wants to enter. Who has heard of the food and fiber versus fuel debate? Or food versus fuel? This is a case where you don't want to grow corn for ethanol, you want to grow it for food, and people are starving. And it's a very complicated discussion. We did not want to get in. So we targeted marginal lands. Now I will ask a, a question. <clears throat> Let me scoot ahead here. Marginal lands. What are marginal lands? Well, the USDA defines them for us. They are lands that are highly erodible, that are low fertility, on which nothing can really be grown profitably, so trees will grow slowly or sometimes they graze it for cattle. So it's very low return land. If it were more productive, we'd be growing corn or soybeans or cane or rice or cotton or something like that. But they're not. So we targeted only marginal lands because we didn't want to displace a food or fiber crop. So our ag economists stepped into the USDA database and grouped by country or by parish in Louisiana where the highest concentration of marginal lands were located. You can see there's a lot of them here in the Mississippi Delta <laughs> and the lower Chenier Plain of Louisiana. They kind of scattered elsewhere. And over against this, we overlaid the following questions. If I wanted to construct a, a bioprocessing facility and I needed to source local feedstock, I don't want to transport that stuff any more than I need to because it's wet and it's heavy and transportation <coughs> is expensive. So I want to have my sites in areas where they have the highest concentration of marginal lands, so the transportation costs would be lower. I also want to put it where there is readily access to rail, natural gas, uh, maybe some water for some, for some river access. So they overlaid all of these together and wrote a complicated equation that I'm not smart enough to understand, but they assure me it's correct, and they've identified optimal locations for locating biorefineries. So far we have data for three states. Northern Mississippi has seven, Arkansas has four, we're here with five. We are working on the other sites for the other states right now. So if you have several million and you want to build one of these, come see me. I can show you exactly where to put it. Logistically, we now know how easy it is to process these. We can use existing equipment. That means if you're a farmer, you don't have to buy any new equipment to harvest, to transport, to plant, or to process this. So it's relatively inexpensive. We've done all of the logistics. And if you really need help to produce it, we have completed published production guides. So if you know nothing about producing sweet sorghum, you can go to our website and you can get this, and it'll lead you through step-by-step step how to produce it. Okay? Very simple. Environmental impacts. We've talked about one of them already. Here's another one. Carbon sequestration. It turns out by growing these biomass crops year in and year out, we're actually sequestering more carbon in the soil than we would using the conventional agronomic crop rotation. Cotton, corn, soybeans, sugarcane, rice, wheat. So it's better for the environment. And of course, we have a pilot plant down at St. Gabriel. I invite you all to come down and see the facility, talk to the scientists, see the project up close and personal, contact me, contact Dr. Kumar, contact, uh, I guess he and I are the best ones to contact, and then we'll arrange for you to have a visit down there. Here we have basically a miniature sugar mill where we grind the cane or the biomass, we produce bagasse, we produce juices, 
which we uh, evaporate down to syrups, and we can do the whole process here at St. Gabriel. Only 15 short minutes away. Okay, now we're leaving ag. We've talked about history. We've talked about agriculture. Now let's move on to the product. What do we do with this? We were told from the beginning we cannot produce ethanol. So we had to find something other than ethanol to work on. And I'm going to talk about a number of different products uh, from syrups, uh, uh, nanomaterials, biopolymers, biobutanol, and some interesting specialty products that are just beginning to roll out of our, our team. And I'm going to do these uh, in sequence. First, syrups and chemicals from feedstock. It is possible to get a pile of biomass and using some pretreatments, we use ammonia, some use acid, and some series of enzymes that you can deconstruct that biomass to get a whole bunch of chemical components, including sugars and some certain fuels. It's possible to do this, but you cannot afford to do this. It's very expensive. So we demonstrated feasibility, but economically, uh, frankly, the cost of oil is driving this really out of the equation for feasibility right now. Just not feasible. But we can produce syrups, especially chemicals, all kinds of fuels, simply by deconstructing the biomass. This is an example of the type of raw chemical materials we can get from them. As chemical engineers, you probably recognize more of these than I do. And you see the areas in which they can be used. We can produce all of these, but they are really just in the early demonstration phase, as I mentioned, simply because of cost logistics. All except for one, aconitic acid. Remember that one, we're going to come back to it. I'll move on now to uh, syrups from conventional juices. You start out with, uh, is that you, Franz, there? Oh, that handsome devil. Uh, this Franz, Dr. Franz Ehrenhauser? Yeah. The thickness of the salt. I'm sorry? The no ratio of me and the thickness of the salt. Okay. So we harvest that, we crush it, and we get, this is what the syrups look like right here. Juices. I'm sorry, juices. So we concentrate these, and this is an example of what we get. In the energy gain syrup, we get uh, bricks of 61 to 72. Sweet sorghum syrup, a little lower in sugar. Sugar cane molasses, even lower. And look at the ash levels, 5 to 9, 7 and 8, and look at this with 14 to 16. So between the color and the ash, this just doesn't look very nice compared to our competition, which is dextrose out of corn from the Midwest. And indeed, this is our target. In order for us to even dream of competing with corn sugars, this is where we have to get, right here. We have a long way to go. Well, Dr. Aaron Hauser has worked long and hard and his team to pull this off. And they have used a series of processes to try to clean up this mess. This is a cross-section of, uh, of syrup. 27% water, 73% dissolved solids. Of that, 8% ash, and these are all the minerals. They mean nothing to me. They may mean something to a chemical engineer. Franz, why are these important? We don't like them. We don't like them, okay. So they mean nothing to you either. They, we need to get rid of them. Because when we sent this syrup to our, business, our corporate partner in Madison, Wisconsin, Virant, and they tried to put it through their proprietary catalyst bed. Uh, within a very short time it was filed. They said, don't dare send us any more. You cost us more money than you helped us. So we had to clear this up. So Dr. Franz started with uh, the mess on the left and using microfiltration, electrodialysis, and ion exchange. We wind up with this. Now, it's not crystal clear, but it looks a whole lot better. How does it spec compared to our goal? As you can see here, starting with juices, the syrups, here's refined dextrose, here is our refined energy cane syrup, thanks to Dr. Franz. 99% plus fermentable sugars, and actually has lower ash than what they see in corn dextrose. So we have exceeded the commercial specs for syrup. The challenge is that, how long did it take you to produce a gallon, Franz? Three weeks. Three weeks to produce one gallon. Go talk to an industry partner about scale-up, 
when he wants 500 gallons and say, okay, I'll see you in 150 weeks. <laughs> okay, it, obviously we have a problem. <clears throat> so our focus now is to work with another corporate partner to, this, to test a piece of equipment to actually chromatographically, chroma, chromatographically separate this so that we can have purified syrup. We're working on that. Franz assures me it's going to be successful. Because I need 300 gallons of pure syrup by this summer. You can tell I'm not an engineer because I said unrealistic expectations. Our corporate partner is Viren. They're in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is a very simple cartoon depiction of their process. They can start with any number of feedstocks. Uh, most simply is ethanol. They can use conventional sugars from any source. They can also use biomass, which can be deconstructed to make sugars to feed into their process. Anything works as long as it's pure. Our feedstocks are, are targeted here. Conventional sugars, and we can deconstruct biomass. So we can feed into both of those channels. The end products are an array of different hydrocarbons. Starting at the top, paraxylene, which is important. Who's got a Coca-Cola bottle? No one has a drink bottle in here? Oh, wait, is there one? No, those are cans. Okay, if you buy a, a Coke bottle from a machine, that contains paraxylene, uh, and Coca-Cola, as you know, wants to go from mostly petroleum to 100% green bottles. How are they going to do? All the way down to jet fuel and diesel at the end of their uh, product scale. So how do our feedstocks fit into this scenario? Well, we focus on a couple. Parazoline to make plastic drinking bottles. And uh, synthetic aromatic kerosene to fit into the jet fuel scenario. So we have sent our syrups up to fit into these feedstock streams. And I just received this slide a few days ago from Virant uh, with the last batch of uh, syrup we sent up. This is a comparison of our syrups and Virant's commercial benchmark, which is pure beet sugar brought up to solution. So it's as pure as you can get, and you can see the baseline and ours are indistinguishable for every parameter. So we have a syrup that is as good as their purified baseline. That's a good thing. How well does it work? Well, we know now that we can, we can use our syrups to produce green plastic. This is a non-chemical engineer talking. We can produce green plastic to go into Coca-Cola or other drinking bottles. Our feedstocks fit nicely into the scenario. I asked my Viren partner, how much would it cost if I sent you a couple hundred gallons of syrup and you sent me back several cases of Coca-Cola bottles made out of Louisiana feedstock <laughs> so I could take them to the legislature and show them how important this is. He laughed and said, between you, all of our scale up and then the polymer production and the production of the bottles and the Coca-Cola trademark, at least a half a million dollars. I said, that's a half million dollars for, for an empty case of Coke bottles. That's too expensive. So I'm using the picture instead. <laughs> Last Friday, we had the privilege of participating in a three-way webinar nationally for the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, <coughs> in which uh, we focused on production of our syrups. I talked 10 or 15 minutes on the logistics of production, harvest, transport, and syrup purification. Turned it over to fire to talk about synthetic uh, aromatic kerosene production. And then we turned it over to Shell. And the presentation they gave says that this product stream, starting from our syrups, is as good as or better than any other jet fuel they've tested. So this was a very successful webinar. We've got a lot of interest. We have a product path here. All I need is more than one gallon per three months, or whatever that, that was. I'm going to change gears now and look at something other than syrups. Uh, working with some, some scientists over in Renewable Natural Resources on cellulose nanomaterials. Of course, bag gas is made almost exclusively from cellulose, so we can break that down and we can use that nanocellulose in uh, what are 
what he calls those energy storage devices. I say cellulose batteries. I don't understand this, but it's pretty cool. He gave me the picture. I put it up there, so if you can understand, good for you. Another one is hydrogels. And uh, I didn't know what a hydrogel was until he told me that it's the stuff inside your baby's disposable diaper. And he can make hydrogels out of our bag gas, cellulose from bag gas, and it works just fine. So there's a potential product there as well. And uh, finally, we have several products already licensed through the Ag Center for drilling uh, fluid additives. And it turns out that one of the products we have is called Tiger Bullets, and it's made from some polymers mixed in with some cellulose. It turns out that adding bag gas cellulose is as good as, if not better than, adding wood cellulose. So this is a potential there for another product stream. Shifting gears again, bioplastics on uh, bio-based polymers. Corn is king. As you know, you can chop up a corn kernel and turn that starch into just about anything you want, from plastics to liquor. We are working on something similar to that, but we're focusing on acetic acid. That's the chemical I told you to remember earlier on in the seminar. And uh, he's not here today, Dr. Michael Vincent from the Department of Chemistry. He's a postdoc. And Dr. John Poorman from the Department of Chemistry are working with us on this. And they're beginning to make plastics by cross-linking some of these chemicals we can pull out of biomass. I told them I wanted an LSU football helmet. All I got was gold L and S and a purple U. <laughs> so they're getting close. But then they said, oh, look at this. So they made a different formulation. This one is a different color, and it's sort of transparent. So there are some things they can do with these plastics that are different than just yellow and gold and purple blocks. The question is, where do they get application? They have some very unique properties. I'm not a polymer chemist, but there's some things you can do with this, some things you can't. One of which is this. How many of you have a cell phone? Okay, what's the average cost of an OtterBox? Forty? Fifty dollars? Okay, how much plastic is in an OtterBox? Pennies. The formulation of plastics that come from our materials will fit very nicely into niche markets such as this. So, we're exploring that as well. And I would love to have a, a cell phone case that say, made from Louisiana sugar cane. Make some people I know very happy. Another application in the biomedical arena, many of you are familiar with Dr. Dan Hayes. Uh, he has partnered with Dr. Giovanna Aita at the Audubon Sugar Institute, and uh, they have taken some of these same polymers from these same chemicals and made scaffolding for human tissue. Here's some bone scaffolding. They can do the same thing with skin scaffolding, and they can change the composition and properties simply by changing the chemicals that go into it. The cool thing about this is that this is biodegradable. You can put this scaffolding into a, into a human body, within a few weeks it decomposes. But the question is, can it grow human cells? And the answer is yes. On the left you see cell growth as a control. On the right you see uh, cell growth on our substrates. You can see after 14 days you get nearly the same human cell growth as on the control. So we can get human cell growth, which means it's feasible that we can use these for uh, for severe damages to bones, severe damages to skin, as scaffolding to facilitate skin and bone regrowth. And after a few weeks, they decompose, human tissue reconstitutes, and you can speed the healing process. And this one is ready for animal testing, so if some of you have some venture capital connections, I need about a half a million dollars to get into some animal testing. So, I have to talk to Dr. Kumar about that. Butanol, all of you are familiar with butanol, it's pushing toward a $10 billion market. Uh, it comes from non-green sources. We can make it <coughs> using bacterial fermentation. We have a bacterium, a clostridium, produces primarily butanol, isobutanol, and ethanol. And <coughs> interestingly enough, the best feedstock has been energy cane syrup or molasses. So this is using our feedstocks to actually feed these buds to produce these uh, these alcohols. We started with the batch process. We were moving toward continuous fermentation. Initially, one gram per liter per hour. Very low. I need more. Their target is 10 grams per liter per hour, and they're working now. Okay, I'm making you nervous, Franz. Okay. 
<laughs> We've got scientists down at Auburn who are working on some fermentation. Uh, the problem is, once this gets to about 1%, it becomes toxic, so you have to remove the butanol at the same time the critter is fermenting it. I'm not an industrial market biologist, but I recognize expertise when I need it. And so this is where we're focusing on, right here. How do you elevate the concentration of butanol without killing the bacteria? And then, how do you separate it from this aqueous bath in which the bacteria are growing? That's Franz's challenge right there. And I think there's a tremendous home run for technology once we finalize the details on separation. So we're working on that as well. And I'm going to wrap up with this. <clears throat> right before we went to the Denver meeting that Dr. Kumar referenced, uh, Dr. Ma Dr. Michael Vincent walked into my office and said, here, have you ever seen this? This is powdered baguettes right here. Just milled cellulose. He was able to work with Dr. Poyman and using that product and some polymers made from our feedstocks in some way that I don't recall, they're able to make this. This happens to be wood putty. But it's not wood putty like you buy at Lowe's. When you go to Lowe's, you buy a tub of wood putty, uh, and for a handful, you'll pay how much? Three, four, five dollars. Very high value product. Uh, if you do what I do, you open the lid, use it two or three times, put it back in your shop, and six months later you go in and it's like a rock, so you throw it away and you spend five, six dollars for another tub, realize that I probably used my pinky's worth, and I spent five dollars for it. So, extremely high value. They were able to formulate a product that is not <coughs> air dry based, but uh, polymerization based. This stuff will stay soft forever. You shove it into a hole, you put a heat gun on it at 100 degrees C, it polymerizes, and within a few minutes it's solid, you can sand it, you can drill it, you can paint it. So we're looking at this and a number of other things, adhesives, epoxies, coatings, all of these up until six months ago, I had no idea we could uh, produce from our feedstocks. We're working on that. We've got about one and a half years left on this project. Most of the ag stuff is done, the production work. We're going to be focusing on um, developing deliverables for the products that we think we can uh, prepare from these feedstocks. Specifically targeting ability to scale up. So this is really a work in progress. And I think that is my last slide. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention. and. Try my best to answer any questions. I'm glad that Dr. Ben is here, Dr. Franz is here, Dr. Moon is here, because they can answer all the questions on all the things I just talked about. <laughs> that was a fantastic lecture. Even better than when I listened to the previous one, because there was some early part, I think, that addresses the right of this I hope you agree with me that it was that. It shows me the connection between the raw material source that nature produces and the chemicals stuff that we produce from fossil fuel, how we can replace that. And that, I think, is the long term solution for the environmental problem, the carbon dioxide problem, etc. Because it's on a sustainable cycle and it captures sun's energy directly into plants to convert all these chemicals. So, you have essentially shown what the future is going to look like, particularly to the end minds here. And I'm sure it will pay off as they grow to advance these technologies. So I welcome questions for Dr. Yeah. Uh, I am not going to be flipping on this. I'm not, not trying to be flipping on this question, but you know, I did a lot of contract work for the paper. Uh, for a paper services company once. And one time they told me the story of sterols, which are like bottom of the barrel stuff for pitch and rosins in the paper industry. Okay? And they said they couldn't give it away for a long period of time because it had all, a lot of the same problems you're talking about with your syrup. But they figured out a way to use it in additives in certain types of foodstuffs where they were able to show that it might have health benefits, okay? 
And now they said they actually it's actually a revenue producing, profit making stream, mostly sold to the Europeans, who I guess are a little more gullible on stuff like this. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's it's really tough to get all that alkali and ash and stuff like that out of these syrup things. Is there any way that we could you could figure out some way to use this stuff without having to get the alkali and the ash out of it, instead of just trying to make plastics and fuels out of it? You know, as some type of uh, product like the, the you know, like, like you were talking about with the epoxies and the, and the wood body, where you don't have to remove all that stuff out of there. That's a good question. Dr. Franz, do you have a good answer? Uh, um, most of the action plant is, particularly in the sugar tea plant, is potassium and chloride. That is a fertilizer that's a feedstock. One part of what we're taking it out, we're still analyzing it, um, comes out as a clean solution, predominantly of uh, potassium chloride. Our next step is going to be crystallizing that out, and you can use it as any other potassium chloride you have uh, mines in. And we'll have very high purity. Um, right now, the U.S. imports about 85% of its potassium chloride, unfortunately, from Canada. So there's not much advantage of producing it really locally. However, uh, the price of potassium has, I think, doubled over the last three years, thanks to China. So two years ago, it wouldn't have made sense. Now it makes sense for that. There are other places in the world where it does make sense, which import more potassium chloride and which do not have a source as conveniently located as we have uh, with Canada. So that's one of them. The other one where we have a product is silica, and we're looking into that. It is uh, the most painful piece to remove and the, the hardest to remove, and we're hoping to find some use to it. But colloidal silica has use to it. So yes, it is possible, um, but uh, we'll see what we have. That's a very good question. To this point, no one has planted a seed in my ear. That's an agricultural reference. We'll plant a seed. Uh, that gives any indication of something we can do with these raw syrups, aside from crystallizing sugar and then feeding the molasses to cat. I, I imagine if there's something that has that could be a higher value use after 225 years, somebody might have thought Crow. about it. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. But uh, that's a good question. So far, between rum, molasses, and uh, raw sugar, that's that's all I've heard. So I've heard that convince people that ashy rum is good for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you take like, you know, in Texas, they actually have to select varieties that have no ash. Because the ash content is so high, they can't crystallize the sugar. So we're, I mean, we're not at that point, we don't have that problem with ash as much with the types of soils that we have. But in Texas, they have very high ash soils, very high in potassium. So they have to select varieties that mm -hmm. they have low ash. Now, all that being said, if you are a health food fan, you can go to a health food store and you can purchase purchase something that they call blackstrap molasses. Mm -hmm. Tastes disgusting. That is the last molasses at the end of the chain and it has the highest ash. And so if you can stomach the taste, it's very high in minerals. And it's very good for your kidney. Goodbye. <laughs> That's essentially what, the, what they're doing with the sterols. Yeah. They're using this, they're presumably health food type additives. Yeah. So how many of you actually go to the health food store and purchase a gallon of black strap molasses per week? <laughs> I can't imagine. None. See? My, that's my point right there. I'm guessing that's a lot of the black strap wrong. It's so cheap. <laughs> I prefer rum made with the higher end products. <laughs> and aged a little more. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You were talking about value polymers when you uh, were talking about Coca Cola. Uh, but you said that those bottles were made of PET. Uh, what kind of process you are using to convert the, that was the acetic acid? Acetic acid? To the, to the okay. Do you know, Franz? <coughs> I was hoping that Michael Vincent would no, be here. No, he's it's silent. The condensation part. So you have to mix them together and you can use them up. You drop the water off. But you don't take pet. 
But if you if you have interest, please send me an email. I will connect you with the scientist. I had hoped to be here, hope we'd be here and answer your question, and I can put him on the spot to answer the question. That's the problem with uh, apologizing at the beginning. I didn't do any of this work, and so I know a very little bit about every aspect, but I don't know deep about hardly anything. Well, you know, one of the things that might be of interest to the chemical engineering, but these are all, I guess, graduate students, is you have capstones in your design projects, and, you know, some of these problems might be suitable for topics for the senior design uh, sequence of chemical engineering, I think. I think. Yeah, I, I think there are great opportunities for uh, chemical engineering working with They bring all the way from the feedstock to the setup, and then there are lots of emerging technologies and technologies. And plants is a kind of engineer from this department, I think. Yeah, so. This is a little bit off of your particular subject, but maybe someone in the room can address it. Bioproducts going towards biofuels. Any of them make economic sense given the, the depressed prices of uh, fossil fuels right now? Uh, and yes. please don't say corn because corn's a political mandate and really isn't the best economic. Uh, there conversion. is there is a factory, a plant in Louisiana, Myriad, in Lake Providence, and they are using a fermentation process to produce succinic acid, biosuccinic acid, which is meets uh, all chemical specs as a feedstock, and they're using uh, these dextrose syrups. So. And that's not, that's not the only one around the country. So they're using the, the corn syrup, the sugar feedstock. Of course, I know I'm not supposed to say the word corn. Right. So I tried not to, but it slipped out. Uh, <laughs> so there are examples where it's, where it's happening. Uh, they are producing butanol in different places. Uh, from uh, There's a yeast activity going on with, is it Evo? I think in Denver, Colorado, they've got an operation out there where they're producing, they're fermenting yeast to produce butanol. There's a, a similar process at the University of Illinois that I think was just licensed. So they can all produce it. They have the same problems we do, that after over 1% it gets toxic. And so they have to separate. So that's where the separation potential could be great. Uh, a lot of people are looking. Uh, right now, 20% of a Coke bottle uh, can be made from green sources. Uh, this makes it possible to do all 100%. <coughs> And Coke is committed to doing that, and they'll pass that upcharge on to the consumers in the way they price their product. So it's it's a beginning to appear in a lot of different sectors. And I know I can't say the word corn, but there's a certain crop in the Midwest that produces a lot of starch that can be polymerized into a bunch of different things, like uh, like this, like who knows what, I cups. Was, you know, cups, you know, stock uh, solo cups, those cups. Uh, Picnic utensils, pallets, uh, all kinds of polymers you can can't make. They make can't they now make biobutanol out of the DDGS part of the corn and not just the kernels? I uh, thought that, you know, I, I've seen a lot of talks from Archer Daniels and Cargill and mm -hmm. people like that. They were claiming that they were going to get away from the kernels to make the biobutanol. They were going to go through using the, the DDGS stuff. Dr. Moon, do you know? If uh, yeah. the, the biobutanol process, uh, the one at the University of Illinois and the one at, at uh, Denver, what is their feedstock? Um, maybe corn stock. Yeah, stock. But these yeah. were, but they didn't, they didn't just have a lot of uh, silicon ash, and they they run into problems with it. I'm just telling you, with not not the universities. I'm telling you, with the industry. Oh, industry. No, there's products. nothing. No, they yeah. they want it. They want, it, but no. They want, but yeah. they're not doing no. it. Yeah. Okay. They, no. The, Butanol is not commercialized yet, but many small companies like kind of going on the research. Uh, but uh, butanol as a biofuel is a little bit difficult compared with the ethanol. But uh, as a pure tanker, it 
kind of cost is five point six point five dollars uh, per gallon. So uh, it's a still it can be used as a plastic material and then like paint and many yeah. So as a pure paper, it is promising. Is there any advantage of the cane leaf material over the stover or the DDGS? Uh, I mean, would there be any chemical advantage of cane leaf material over those two? Um, I don't think the cane leaf material has enough sugar to feed the bugs. Is bacteria you use syrups or molasses to feed your, your bacteria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a pretty rich well, medium. The effect. feds are really trying to push, you know, if you look at the fed mandates, they're really trying to push not using the, the corn kernels anymore. They really want to push using the, the, the things right. like the stove. So, I mean, you really, it's like the, the bear chasing two people in the woods. You don't have to be the fastest, you just have to be faster than the other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just can't be the slowest. Yeah. 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 If not, please join me. Thank you.